This is, and it's entitled, You Are Worth More Than Many Sparrows. Brother uh, some years ago in France, a deranged mental patient took a knife and slashed a Picasso painting valued at five to seven million dollars. Interestingly, no one suggested that the painting be discarded simply because it was damaged. Rather, art restoration experts immediately tried to figure out how to restore the painting. Why? Because that painting is precious in the eyes of art lovers. It occurs to me that Satan is a lot like that deranged mental patient because he's out to damage us. Many of us have experienced years of ill treatment, racism, hatred in Satan's world. You add to that the abuse of children, which reflects satanic thinking, emotionally wrecking the lives of millions. Life in Satan's system can easily leave us feeling like we're little more than damaged, worthless goods. One sister put it this way, I believe in Jehovah's kingdom very much. However, I don't really feel that I'm good enough to be there. Another sister wrote and put it this way, I have suffered with depression since I was a little girl. It was next to impossible for me to believe that I could enter into the new world. I felt such self-hatred that I thought Jehovah, who knew me so well, could never love or approve of me. Many people with depression feel a self-loathing in the face of all reason or facts. We sincerely believe that there is nothing about us that is any good, and we can come up with all kinds of reasons to prove it. Now, while it's true that all of us are tainted by inherited sin, does that mean that when Jehovah God looks at you, that he sees you as little more than damaged, worthless goods? Absolutely not. And we're going to consider two questions in this brief discussion. The first is, why is it important that we have a healthy, balanced sense of self-worth? And number two, what are you worth in the eyes of the only one who really matters, Jehovah God? Well, first off, why is it important that we have a healthy or balanced sense of self-worth? Well, there are four reasons. Number one, your sense of self-worth can actually affect your relationship with Jehovah. You see, feelings of inadequacy or worthlessness or self-hatred could actually cause someone to stop serving God, feeling that he's just not worthy of serving Jehovah. Some people blame themselves for the injustices and abuses they suffer in Satan's world. And as long as you blame yourself, you will find ways to punish yourself perhaps by acting out in self-destructive ways. It makes me wonder how many who get disfellowshipped each year actually just gave up because they just felt worthless inside. A second reason we need a healthy sense of self-worth. It can actually affect your relationship with fellow humans. You see, low self-worth can make it difficult for you to properly value the worth of others. You have negative feelings about yourself. It's all too easy to project those feelings onto those around you, damaging your relationship with them. A third reason we need a healthy sense of self-worth, it can actually affect your share in the Christian ministry. It can actually affect your desire to share in the ministry. How so? Well, one of our motivations for sharing in the preaching work is love of neighbor, right? But according to Jesus, you must love your neighbor as yourself. 
And what that means is you need to love yourself in order to love your neighbor. So if you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. If you don't love your neighbor, your very desire or motivation to share the good news with your neighbor could be eroded. A fourth reason we need a healthy sense of self-worth is this. Low self-worth makes you vulnerable. And Satan knows this well. Now you might open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 24. And let's note what the wise man said about this. Proverbs chapter 24, and we'll look at verse 10. The wise man said, Have you shown yourself discouraged in the day of distress? Your power will be scanty. Now, the beginning part of the verse, that expression, shown yourself discouraged, according to some scholars, the Hebrew here can mean to become weak, to become feeble, or to lose courage. And Solomon says that such feelings can happen to you on the day of distress. What is the day of distress? Well, it's not some particular calendar day of the year. The idea is that whenever in life you face feelings or challenges or problems that just seem overwhelming to you, for you, that is a day of distress. And according to the latter part of the verse, this, Solomon says, uh, your power will be scanty. Another translation here reads, your strength will be small. In other words, prolonged discouragement can sap your strength. And this makes you vulnerable. And Satan knows this. I mean, it's hard enough that we have to contend with our own imperfections and shortcomings and mistakes, which can get us to feel downhearted at times. The problem is, Satan will exploit negative feelings. He'll exploit feelings of discouragement, depression. Why? Because he wants you to give up. He wants you to feel so worthless that you just stop serving Jehovah. One brother put it this way, if Satan cannot break your integrity, he will try to break your heart. It's as if he's whispering in your ear, you are worthless. You don't matter to Jehovah. Jehovah doesn't care about you as an individual. But Satan is a liar, and we must not forget that. What we need is a healthy view, a balanced view, Jehovah's view of our self-worth. And what's that? Well, that brings me to the second question I raised. Uh, what are you worth in the eyes of the only one who ultimately matters? And that is Jehovah God. Well, Jesus uh, gave an illustration that beautifully answers this question. It's found at Matthew chapter 10. In fact, this illustration was so close to the heart of Jesus that he actually used it on more than one occasion. Let's look at the first occasion, Matthew chapter 10, and we'll take a look at verses 29 to 31. Jesus said, Do not two sparrows sell for a coin of small value? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's knowledge. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore, have no fear. You are worth more than many sparrows. Now let's take a good close look at these beautiful words of Jesus. At the beginning of verse 29, he refers to sparrows. Now, in Palestine in the first century CE, sparrows were the cheapest of all the birds used for food. And Jesus knew this well. Uh, perhaps he'd observed women in the marketplace, poor women, trying to purchase these birds. Maybe when he was a boy, 
he accompanied his mother Mary to the marketplace. They were a poor family, evidently. And perhaps Jesus had watched his mother on more than one occasion, trying to buy a few of these birds to go home and make a meal for her family. Now, Jesus refers to a coin of small value. This would have been an Assarian coin. An Assarian coin in the first century in Palestine was worth one-sixteenth of a denarius. That would be about 45 minutes wages. In today's values, an Assarian coin would be worth less than five cents. Now, according to Jesus, for one of such coins, a woman could purchase how many sparrows? He says two, right? For two, a coin, one coin, you get two sparrows. Now, keep your marker here in Matthew, and let's skip over to Luke chapter 12. Because about a year later, Jesus restated the illustration. And I don't know about you, but that's interesting to me. I mean, here's the master teacher who could frame an illustration, right, like no one else, could have come up with something else, but there was something about this illustration that must have been close enough to his heart that he reused it. Only a year later, he reused it with a very significant difference. It's at Luke chapter 12, verse 6, that Jesus restated the illustration. But here he says, five sparrows sell for two coins of small value. Now, isn't that interesting? For one coin, you could buy two. For two coins, you could buy not four, but five. So cheap were these little birds that an extra one could be thrown into the bargain as if it had no value at all. Now let's go back to Matthew's account. Because Jesus uh, goes on to say, there in the latter part of verse 29, that not one of these birds, not even the extra one, that could be thrown into the bargain as if it had no value, not one of these birds could fall to the ground without your father's knowledge. Now, Jesus didn't explain why the sparrow might fall to the ground, whether because it might be sick or injured. But in the original Greek, there's something about the wording that would also allow for the sparrow simply to come down and alight on the ground in search of food. But regardless of the reason why the sparrow would fall or come down to the ground, Jesus said not one of them can come to the earth without Jehovah's knowledge. Imagine the sparrow that might be forgotten by man would never be forgotten by God. Jehovah took note of these little cheap birds. Now in verse 30, Jesus, uh, right in the middle, switched illustrations to make a similar point. He says, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Now, there are about 100,000 hairs on the average human head. Now, obviously, more on some than on others, right? But according to Jesus, right, I mean, one strand of hair may look like another, but according to Jesus, each strand of your hair is noticed and numbered by Jehovah. I mean, is Jehovah really capable of knowing you down to such small details? Absolutely. If you were to die today and Jehovah to resurrect you in the new world, would he not know what kind of hair to put on your head, the color, what color your eyes should be? The point Jesus is making is that you are of such value to Jehovah that he takes note of even the smallest of details about you, such as the number of hairs on your head. And then driving home the point of the two illustrations, in verse 31, Jesus says, Therefore have no fear. You are worth more than many sparrows. 
Now, these words are not a comparison, but a contrast. I mean, Jesus here wasn't saying, you know, guess what? You're worth 10 cents about the cost of five sparrows. No. This is an example of what some scholars call uh, the, in Latin, the a fortiori reasoning. Uh, that means to the stronger. It means you start with a premise and you reason to a stronger conclusion. And Jesus often did this with the words, how much more so? And so the point he's making here is that if Jehovah notices and values a sparrow, even the extra sparrow that might be thrown into the bargain as if it had no value, if Jehovah values these birds that cannot even think about him, let alone love him, how much more so must he value you, a human made in his image, a human who's made a conscious decision to love and to serve Jehovah. What's the point of Jesus' words here at Matthew chapter 10? The lesson is, no matter how valueless you may feel, you are worth more than many sparrows in the eyes of the one who really matters, Jehovah God. Why is it important? that you have a balanced view of your self-worth? We noted four reasons, right? Your sense of self-worth can affect your relationship with God, can affect your relationship with fellow humans, can affect your share in the Christian ministry, and a low sense of self-worth can make you vulnerable. What are you worth in Jehovah's eyes? According to Jesus, you're worth more than many sparrows. Jehovah takes note of even the smallest of details about you because you mean that much to him. And just thinking back to a moment to that damaged Picasso painting I referred to at the outset, I might put it this way. When Jehovah God looks at you, he does not just see you in the damaged state that you're in at present due to sin and imperfection. When Jehovah looks in your heart, you know what he sees? He sees the masterpiece that you will be when he's finished repairing you through the restorative value of Jesus' ransom sacrifice in that new world to come. It reminds me of the story of the famous Italian beginning a new sculpture. And the master was standing there before this huge, shapeless piece of stone. And someone came along and asked him, what are you doing? And Michelangelo thought for a moment, and he said, I am releasing the angel imprisoned in this marble. When he looked at that stone, he saw not only what was, but what it had the potential to be when he was finished sculpting it. And you know what? That's exactly how Jehovah looks at you and me. He sees not only what you are at present, he sees the potential, what you have the potential to be when he's finished sculpting you in the new world. Meanwhile, brothers, do not let Satan demoralize you. Recognize that Satan will try to use negative feelings. He will wait for you to be discouraged, to feel down or depressed, and then he will try to exploit those feelings in order to get you to stop serving Jehovah. Never forget, if Satan cannot break your integrity, he will try to break your heart. Do not let him win. No, never let him convince your heart that you don't matter to Jehovah. When we have a healthy sense of self-worth, when we can tap into Jehovah's view of our worth, it is so much easier to give to Jehovah what he so lovingly asks of all of us, and that is worship and service that is the very best that we can give. And may Jehovah bless each and every one of you as you do your best to give him all that you're capable of giving him in his service. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Well, on behalf of my wife, Joanne, and I, I would just like to take a minute to let you know how much it means to us to be able to come out and visit with you here. Um, and I tell congregations this each month because this is truly how we feel. Um, being at Bethel is a wonderful way of life. I know there are some here in the congregation who at one time served at Bethel. It's a wonderful way of life, but we recognize that it is a sheltered way of life. Uh, we can live and, and work with brothers and sisters who are in the full-time ministry, fully devoted to Jehovah, but we recognize that that's not the reality for most of our brothers, and it's so important for us not to lose touch, not to lose sight of that. And so when we get out and visit congregations like this, it gives us a little dose of reality, the reality that you brothers and sisters are dealing with every day, and we don't ever want to lose sight of that. I know the brothers I work with at Bethel are absolutely determined to give you articles that address your needs, but they can't do that unless they know what your needs are. And they can't know that unless they get out and rub shoulders with you and listen to you. And during the course of weekends like this, we do our best to listen as you express some of the cares of your heart, and we take that home with us. And I can tell you this, that weekends like this and hearing from you help us to be better at our work back at headquarters. Now, we recognize that this would not be possible as if you as congregations did not pass a resolution to make it happen. So whatever this may mean for you, I can't say. But I can tell you what this means for us. So thank you very, very much for allowing us to come and visit with you. And if you don't have to rush out, please, by all means, come up and say goodbye. We'd love to chat with you as time permits. Okay, any other announcements before we conclude? I think we're to close with song number 212. We thank you, Jehovah. <laughs>